Chapter 6. Jimmy Austin. The ball once struck off away flies the boy to the next destined post and then home with joy. Anonymous 1774. I guess most people have must have thought I was crazy. 24 years old and leaving a good job to go off and play a boys game. After just finishing four years of apprenticeship too and finally getting to be a full-fledged machinist. In a way, I guess it did look like I was off my rocker, but it all depends on how you look at it. Me, I was always crazy about baseball. See, I was born in Swansea, Wales, and I didn't make it to the country until I was eight years old. So I had to make up for a lot of baseball I missed up to then. I never could get in enough of it. Now, 85 years old, my present and for Christmas for my wife is always the sporting news. And I still read that thing from beginning to end the same day it gets here. So I knew it was the right thing to do. But it's true that I didn't get to the big leagues until I was almost 30. But I was still playing regular when I was past 40. And then I stayed on another 20 years as a coach. Golly, if I had it all do it all over, the only thing I'd do different would be to start sooner and stop later. It was great. Heck, I even played in a big league game when I was 50 years old. It was near the end of 1929, and I was coaching for the old St. Louis Browns. Dan Howley was the manager that year. It was late in the game, but we were ahead, and some of the fellows were kidding me about how good a player I'd been. Well, darn if Dan and didn't haul off and put me right in there at third base. 50 years old I was, I had two chances to handle them both with clean. Got up to bat, boy, I wish I'd gotten a hit. My dad was a shipbuilder in Wales. He came over here in 1885 and settled in Cleveland, where he went to work during the same sort of thing. A couple years later, he brought the rest of the family over. After I finished school, I went to work at Westinghouse, where I found wound up becoming a machinist apprentice. Well, a month after my four years of apprenticeship had ended, that would be 1903, the union went on strike. And, of course, I had to go out with the rest of the boys. I was puttering around the house one day when a fellow came to the front door. My mother had died and my sister... Or I, I was the oldest of eight children, was keeping house. I was in the backyard doing something, and she came back and said, Jim, you're wanted. Some gentleman would like to see you. I went out front, and it was a guy from Warren, Ohio. He says, You're Jim Austin. I've heard of you. You play ball around here with the Franklin Athletic Club, don't you? Yes, I do, I said. Well, he says, how would you like to come to Warren and play independent ball? We have a pretty good little league. You go factory teams and we can pay you $40 a month plus a job. All right, I said. It didn't take me long to make up my mind. Hell, I always wanted to be a ball player. Ed Delhanty, Bill Bradley, Tommy Leach had all come from Cleveland and made it. Why not me? Besides, we're uh, out on strike, so I didn't have any money coming in any way. That's fine, he says. Now, do you know where I might be able to get a good outfielder? Why, sure, I said. I can get you the best outfielder in town. So I went to Ud Paskert's house and told him about it. He went and w with me to Warren. Well, we played in that little independent league that summer, and when I went back to work at Westinghouse, that was in the fall. The next spring, though, I got a letter from Day the Dayton Club in the Central League. That was an organized ball. Somebody was had recommended both Dodd and me to Dayton, and they both made offers to both of us. So off we went to Dayton. We played together there for three years, and then in 1907, they sold Dodd to Atlanta in the Southern League and me to Omaha in the Western League. I stole 97 bases with Omaha in 1908, and at the end of the season, I was sold to the New York Yankees. I played 14 years Here's in the American League. Dodd came came up with Cincinnati and played for 15 years in the National League. So I guess you might say we both made good. Of course, they weren't called the Yankees then. We were called the New York Highlanders because we played in a little park only seated about 15,000, located at 168th Street and Broadway, which was on pretty high ground. You could 
look from the stands and see all the way down the Hudson River sometimes. We were called the Helltoppers. The Islanders were a pretty good team, and I joined them in 1909. We ended in fifth in 1909 and second behind the A's in 1910. Three real old-timers were on that club when I got there. Willie Keeler, Kid Elberfield, and Jack Chesbro. Gee, they were great fellows. They were very close to 40 by then, and they didn't play any much longer. But I got to a thrill just being on the same team with them. You know, you hear all that stuff about the old-timers being so rough on rookies in those days. Well, you can't prove it to me. Those guys were swell to me. Wee Willie Keeler was still a pretty good ball player. Even then, he could loop them over the infield better than anybody I ever saw. Wonderful fellow. I was too shy to say anything to him, but he came to me one day and said, Jim, you got a great career ahead of you. If I can and help you in any way, you just say the word. How about that? And Kid Elberfield. Golly, I was out and after the kid's third base job. Uh, he always treated me fine. One day, the kid it in a ha- got in a hassle with Tim Hurst, the, a tough uh, old umpire, got suspended for five days and was fined 50 bucks. The kid slid into second base safe on a double, or well, sure as could be, and Tim, who was umpiring behind the plate, called it a foul ball. Well, the kid started arguing with Tim, and while he's taking it, Talking, taking, talking. He's all the while jabbing Tim in the belly with his finger. Finally, Tim took his mask off and whammo! He whacked it right across the kid's nose. After they separated them, they were both suspended. Anyway, the point of this all all is George Stallings, who was our manager. Then put me in at third base while the kid was out. And do you know that Alberfield insisted on me sleeping in a lower berth on a, on the train? Lower berths were for the regulars. Us second stringers slept in the uppers. I was climbing into the, my upper one night, and after I'd been and in there at third base a few days, the kid had saw me. He grabbed me by the ankles and said, Where do you think you're going? This is my berth, I said. The hell it is, he said. The hell it ain't, I said. I've had at it ever since I've been with the club. Well, you're not going to have it anymore, he said. He marched me over to the club secretary and says, Put this youngster in a lower berth. Take mine if you have to. He's playing every day, hustling, take take the devil out there. He needs his rest. That's the way the old-timers treated a rookie in those days. At least that's the way they treated me. Stallings was a fine manager, one of the best, like I said. We finished in second place in 1910, and you've got to say he deserved a lot of the credit for that. Talk about cussing. Golly, he had them all beat. He cussed something awful once in a game. He gave me a real little going over. After that night, he called me in and said, Jim, I'm sorry about this afternoon. Don't pay any attention to me when I say those things. Just forget it. It's only because I get so excited and and want to win so bad. Late in 1910, we had just finished a series in Cleveland, and we were on a, a boat going to play Detroit. Nobody could find Hal Chase. Hal had been the Highlander's first baseman for years. Well, he just disappeared. The next day, we found out uh, what had happened. When we got into in, on the boat for Detroit, he had taken the train in New York. He'd gone to Mr. Farrell, the president of the club, and complained about Stallings and a lot of other things. Mr. Farrell supported Chase, so Stallings quit. And Chase was made the new manager. God, what a way to ruin, run a ball club. Well, you know how, how good a manager Chow Hayes was, or how Chase was, so good that he took over a club that finished second in 1910 and took them straight to sixth place in 1911. And the year after, they wound up last. And you know that Stallings did a few year, years later with the Boston Braves, he managed them from last place on the 4th of July to win the pennant and beat the Philadelphia A's in the World Series. Anyway, one of the first things Chase did after he was made manager was trade me and Frank Laporte to the St. Louis Browns. 
Stallings always liked Frank and me. He liked us because we hustled. The pepper kid, Stallings always used to call me. The And because Stallings liked us, Hal traded us. Boy, oy, that chase was something. He finally left baseball when he got mixed up in gambling and that sort of stuff. He was always like that. I remember in 1910, we had a utility player on the Highlanders by in the name of Jack Knight. Somebody gave Jack a new bat, and it was suited it for him. Boy, he hit like a fool with it. Hal Chase had a thousand bats himself, but he always wanted the other guys, especially if it, it was somebody who was hitting good. So Hal says, you don't mind if I use your bat, do you, Jack? I'd rather you didn't, Jack said, because it's the only one I've got. Well, by gosh, Chase got so mad that he took Jack's bat and slammed it up against the dugout. Well, as hard as he could, well, that's the kind of guy he was. So they made him the manager. Yay. Turned out, though, that it was a big break for me, be, him trading me to the Browns like that. Because I stayed there for over 20 years as a player until 1922, as a coach for more for 10 more years after that. When I went to St. Louis in 1911, the Browns were the team in, of the town. You know, oh, it wasn't until the late 20s and the 30s that the Cardinals became the big team in St. Louis. But back then, it was the Browns. When I got to St. Louis, Bobby Wallace was the manager, one of the greatest feeling shortstops who ever lived, you know. It was a delight to play third base next to that fellow. Bobby played most... Most of his career with the Browns. He was their regular shortstop from 1902 to about 1914 or so. Anyway, they made Bobby play a playing manager in 1911, but he wasn't a very happy as a manager. And in the middle of the 1912 season, they got George Stovall to replace him. Bobby stayed at shortstop, though, for a, a few more years. George was a playing manager, too. He managed and played first base. However, George bit himself out of a job the next year. Yeah, that's right. He expectorated himself right out of a job. He got into an argument with an umpire by the name of Charlie Ferguson. It was an awful rumpus. They were hollering at each other, one thing and another. And finally, Ferguson threw George out of the game. Well, before the, he left, George had to go back to first base to get his glove. Our dugout was on the third base side, so Stovall walked as slow as he could all the way around behind the umpire and into first base, picked up his glove, and then started back the same way, maybe even slower. Well, the longer he walked, the matter he got, and the longer he, he took, the matter the umpire got. As George came around or behind Ferguson on the way back to our, our dugout, the umpire told George to hurry it up. I guess that was the straw that broke the camel's back because George felt fly, let fly with a big glob of tobacco juice. Patooey! That just sp spattered all over Ferguson's face and coat and everywhere else. Oh, it was an awful mess. It was terrible. George always did chew in an uncommonly large wad, and you know. Well, they suspended George for that. In fact, they went and threw him clear out of the league. I don't believe he ever played another game in the American League, although I think that George did manage the Kansas City Club in the Federal League later on. So there we were in the middle of the season. That was 1913 without a manager. So what did Mr. Hedges, the president of the club, about to be temporary manager until they got a new one? Of all people, me. Mr. Hedges called me in after George was suspended and said, Jim, will you come out to my apartment tonight? Sure, I said. Where is it? How was I supposed to know where or the devil he lived? He told me, so I went out there, and when I got there... Here's this Branch Ricky fellow. He'd been a second-string catcher years before with St. Louis, but since he'd become a lawyer and was at the University of Michigan as a teacher or a baseball coach or something, or something. Jim, I want you to meet Mr. Ricky. And Mr. Ed 
said Mr. Hedges. Mr. Ricky is going to be the new manager next year, and we'd like you to finish out as manager for the rest of the season, which, of course, I did. So that's how I met Branch Ricky. A year or two later, Branch brought George Sisler to the Browns. Branch had been in his coach at the University of Michigan, and you know the tremendous ball player Sis became. One of the greatest who ever lived. Golly, he hit like blazes. 407 one year, 420 another. He was unbelievable with that bat. Really, you had to see it to believe it. You know what happened last December? The phone rang and some guy with a real rep voice says, Are you going to be home tomorrow? Yeah, I'll be home tomorrow, I said. Well, I expect to be there about lunchtime. Who the hell is this, I said. It's Branch Ricky, he says. So old Branch showed up and we spent hours talking about old friends and replaying old ball games. It was great. It was Branch's Sunday manager. Or I was Sunday's... So I became... Branch's Sunday manager, you know. He promised his mother and father he'd never go near a ballpark on Sunday. So I managed the team for him every Sunday all the time he was with the St. Louis Browns. Just think of me, a third baseman, playing most of my years, throwing over to Hal Chase or George Sisler at first base. Why, that's heaven for a third baseman. There's no doubt there were the two greatest fielding first basemen who ever lived, and that's in anybody's book. Of the two, I guess I'd have to say that Chase was the better fielder. In a way, I hate to say that, but you have to give the devil his due. Sis was a better all-around ball player. He started out with us as a pitcher, you know. I was at third base one day in 1915 when he outpitched Walter Johnson and beat him 2-1. to one. And, of course, Sis was a better hitter, one of the best of all time, but just on fielding alone, I'm afraid I have to pick Chase. And pitchers, boy, did we have of them. Lefty Grove was fast, and Sandy Koufax is too, but you have to, if sh- the, you should have seen Walter Johnson. On a cloudy day, you couldn't see the ball half the time. It came in so fast, that's the honest-to-goodness truth. But I'd rather bat against Walter than some of the uh, other fastball pitchers because Walter was so damn careful. He was too good at a guy. Scared stiff, he'd ni- he'd hit somebody. A lot of the others didn't care. The hell with you, you know. I remember one day Walter had us as beat 10-2 or something like that. And he yells to me, here's one right in there. Let's see you hit it. Well, he threw a medium fast one. And then let her hide and hit it clear over the right field fence. Laugh? I don't know which one of us is laughing harder. As I was going around the bases, uh, of course, that was the exception. Usually I couldn't come close to hitting Walter and neither could anyone else. I was playing against him that day in 1913 when he pitched the... 54th consecutive scoreless inning to beat Jack Combs' record of 53 in a row. He reached 56 straight scoreless innings of pitching before we finally got a run off of him. I guess that record still stands even today, over half a century later. And old Rube Waddle, what a card that big guy was. You know, when I first came to the big leagues, they didn't have clubhouses in most parks, especially not for the visiting team. We'd get into uniform at, a ho- at the hotel and ride out to the ballpark in a bus drawn by four horses. They used to call it a tally hell. In those days, we'd sit on seats along the sides and ride in uniform to the ballpark and, pat- and back. The ride was always a lot of fun. Kids running alongside as we passed and rotten tomatoes as once in a while. Always lots of excitement when the ball club rode by, you know, when plenty of yelling back and forth as you can well imagine. But what I started to tell you was about Rube Waddle. When I was with the Highlanders, or the Yankees, 
Rube was with the St. Louis Browns. He'd left Connie Mack by then and was near the end of his career. He'd le- er, This day, I'm thinking about we were right into the ballpark in this Talio to play the Browns, knowing Rube was going to pitch against us. As we got near the park, somebody yelled, Hey, look, there's Rube! And darn if it wasn't. He was scheduled to pitch that day, but there he was standing out in front of the of the swinging doors of a saloon with a mug of beer that big. He's waving and yelling to us, and while we're yelling and laughing back and forth, he holds up the beer like a, as to say, skull, and downs to the whole thing. Chug a lug right like that, and as the talio continued on, we saw Rube go back into the salon. Into the saloon. Excuse me. Of a saloon. Doggone it though when in game time came. Darn if Rube wasn't out there ready to pitch. I'll never forget it as long as I live. We went along all right for three innings. But in the fourth we got two men on and on base. And when Rube grooved one to me which I promptly hit over the fence. As I'm trotting around the bases, Rube is watching me all the way as he kept turning around on top of the mound. He got dizzy, and by golly, he fell over right on his rear end. Fell over right flat on his can. Oh, that started everybody to laughing so hard we hardly played. Or we could hardly play. Some guys laughed so much, they practically had, had a fit. All except the St. Louis manager, Jack O'Connor. He came running out and yelled, Come on out of there. You didn't, didn't want to pitch anyhow. Somehow, they made everybody laugh all the more. Good old Rube and his life. He gave a lot of people of enjoyment. So did Babe Ruth, too. The Babe was always friendly. A real nice guy who'd go out of his way anytime to do you a favor. I guess when you talk like about uh, about the greatest ball players ever, baseball players who ever lived, it has to be either Babe Ruth, Ty Cobb, or Honus Wagner. I didn't and see much of Wagner because he was in the National League, but I played for years against both Cobb and Ruth. And I hate to have to choose between them. Golly, by both of those guys could beat you in so many ways it wasn't funny. Ty could get real nasty on the field, you know. Off the field, though, he was a pretty good guy. See that picture? It was a famous picture. It's Cobb sliding into third, and the other guy is me being knocked sprawling. He took my left foot with his shoulder as he came in, and down I went. See, the ball put on near my right knee. Look at Cobb's face. That guy wanted to win the worst way. Ty was fair enough on the bases, though. He nicked me a a couple of times, but it wasn't my fault. I don't blame him. I remember one day Ty was on first base, and Sam Crawford hit a single to right field on which Ty comes all the way around to third. I just stood there non as though nothing happened. At the last minute, here comes the ball as Ty is sliding in. I grab it real quick and right in the same motion, pushed his foot off the bag as I tagged him. Well, the umpire called Ty out. Ty didn't move a, a muscle. Just laid on the ground, and then he took up, or then he looked at me, excuse me, in that southern and brog of his, he said very slowly, Mister, don't you ever dare do that no more. When Cobb was out there on the ball field, look out. He wasn't any anybody's friend. He was out to win regardless, but I got along with him all, all right off the field. He was a better guy off the field than he was on. Now, Babe Ruth was different. What a warm-hearted, generous soul he was. Always friendly, always time. I'm for a laugh or a wise crack. The babe always had a twinkle in his eye. When he hit a homer against us, he'd never trot past third without giving me a wink. 
Dave would give you the shirt off his back. All you had to do was ask him. The big fellow wasn't perfect. Everybody knows that. But the guy had a heart. He really did. A heart as big as a watermelon made out of pure gold.